Welcome back, everyone. I'm David Greenberg, and you're watching freedomvibe.art. I have back here for the second time, very special guest, Brandon Joe Williams. Uh, some of you guys saw the first interview that we did about six months ago. Uh, but I know some of you guys, as shocking as it is, may have not be familiar with Brandon's work. So just by way of a quick introduction, Brandon Joe Williams is an author, researcher, an educator, an attorney in fact, an entrepreneur, a serial podcast guest, public speaker, YouTuber, freedom activist, and king of the Amnesty Coalition Nation. The defining event of Brandon's current mission that we're gonna talk about today occurred just a few years ago when a gang of mafia thugs calling itself the Employment Development Department trespassed on a job site of a landing, landscaping company that he had recently acquired, harassed employees, and subsequently offered to extort Brandon for an arbitrary sum of money for quote unquote, not playing by the rules. After being told by several professionals, lawyers and accountants to just make a payment plan, Brandon's response was, make a payment plan to pay extortion money? Yeah, I don't think so. So having decided to stand his ground, Brandon then turned to the advice of a longtime friend and colleague who had already planted the idea that there exists a lawful framework to free oneself from debt slavery and unlawful commercial contracts. So over the ensuing months, Brandon immersed himself in research and then emerged guns blazing, ready to fully implement what he had learned. This resulted not only in attaining remedies for himself for certain financial matters, but also gave birth to his landmark free video course, which if you haven't taken, I highly recommend you check it out, the Contract Killer Course, which you can find on his website, onestupidfuck.com. And yes, you heard me correctly. So thus began what would eventually explode, it has exploded, and I'm very excited to be a part of this, into a worldwide movement of practical sovereignty and real tangible freedom. So Brandon's main goal, as I see it, is really to help us activate our sovereignty and activate our freedom that is our birthright by gaining a holistic understanding of common law, which of course comes from natural law, as a contrast to statute, which is the law of commerce, corporations, and commercial contracts. So right now, and this is what we're going to talk about today, I'm super excited to hear about this. Brandon is balls deep in some litigation. That's his main strategy right now. He's already filed some groundbreaking lawsuits. I think we should jump right in, and, and I'm looking forward to this conversation today where we're going to kind of pick up where we left off. So Brandon, welcome back, my friend. Thank you. That was a hell of an intro. Thank you very much. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's lots of good stuff happening, lots of litigation. Basically, you know, I, I see, you know, for many years, what was, I, what was I doing? I was running around trying to find what process works um, and the definition right. of which process works, the definition of the word works would be, you know, I mail some stuff in and things actually happen that I'm trying to get done, essentially. Right. Um, then after a couple of years of doing that uh, and watching everybody else under the sun, moon and stars do that, I realized that the problem isn't the process. The problem is in getting the process followed the way the law says the process should be followed, which I deem the term enforcement, meaning hmm. I send you something and it's lawful and you're not allowed to uh, per the law to not do it, but then you you don't do it, and then you act as though you're not going to do it. That would be uh, an enforcement issue. That would not be a process issue. So um, that sent me down the rabbit hole of how do I get processes to be complied with? And then I did a lot of fun things such as Polaroids, love letters, poems. Uh, I went through a whole phase of that. I went through phases of trying to call. I went through phases of email. I went through phases of sending uh, mail, certified mail they had signed for. 
Uh, I got a lot of very, very empty, very vapid, very worthless responses that had nothing to do with anything that were form letters. And I just went through, you know, a year and a half of trying to figure out how do I enforce the law? And eventually, um, you know, and I kind of knew all roads were leading to this throughout the past couple of years, but I didn't want to get into it because it seemed to be very overwhelming and very difficult. And it kind of is um, in a way. And it's also very uh, um, enlightening and very rewarding and very fun on the other side after you get started with it. Uh, all roads lead to mainline litigation. So that has been, we found our first lawsuit, I think in February and we're four lawsuits deep, but we have many, 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 many still to file. And, and I'm not sure if this train's ever going to stop. Uh, so yeah, so, so that's just the beginning. The four that we have now is just barely getting started. Uh, the train is just barely leaving the station on this whole thing. And yeah, so now I'm learning litigation as I go. I'm, I'm working with my right hand man, Joey Kimbrough, who's listed on my Williams and Williams law firm website and the about section. Um, he's already won a bunch of cases himself, uh, what's called pro se, which means that you don't have an attorney at law uh, representing you in a court. It's, it's you're by yourself. Um and so he understands the procedure really well. He understands uh, a lot of things that I don't understand, things that I can't really teach. Like, for example, how do you locate which district to file in? Um, how do you know, you know, what what documents to file or what things to do? There's, there's a lot of things that I still have not learned very well, but there's a lot of things I have learned very well, um, such as how to write a complaint, which is the initial um document that you will file when you're filing a lawsuit um, or how to respond to various things or how to operate within the confines of the procedure of the courts. I'm learning a lot of that right now. So um, yeah, uh, it's a work in progress. I am going to be releasing a pro se litigant course eventually. Um, once I really learn everything A to Z and um, once I actually win some stuff or at least get close something you know what i mean a hundred percent and one of the things that kind of it gave me some enthusiasm about this conversation is there's kind of a a comparative study going on here and what i mean by that is so you had made a reference to the fact that before you got into litigation you had obviously sent for example a number of conditional acceptance letters i know because you you published some videos and talked about it. And I actually uh, I embraced what you said, that this is a very powerful tool. You also turned me on to Christopher Hauser. Mm -hmm. um, and I went deep into, after studying your material, I went and basically watched all of his videos at least once. And um, I did start sending off some conditional acceptance letters myself last year, kind of around the time that we were talking. Yeah. I, but I realized that I had not implemented them with the process that Chris teaches, where you put the claim of lien into the actual conditional acceptance letter. So I went back later and started doing that. And I just sent off my first contract to the treasury, to Janet over at the treasury to collect on a claim of lien. So I'm kind of seeing it as almost like a different way to obtain, to, in, to use your word, to enforce the contract. Uh, to uh, basically, you know, uh, enforce non-performance or create a penalty for non-performance because it is a contract, right? So uh, it, I think it'd just be interesting to compare notes on that. Uh, I, just like you, I don't have any real results from filing that contract with the treasurer yet because I literally just did it in the last 30 days. Um but I'm, I'm obviously, you know, like you are with the litigation, I'm very uh, kind of, you know, hold, you know, waiting with bated breath to see what happens. So, uh, yeah, I'm just very interested in your take on that as far as, uh, you know, the, the comparison between the two approaches and any any early wins or early insights into the the, the cases that you're running. Yeah, so we can go through um, we can go through my Amex case. Uh, let's see. We can do that now if you'd like. We can just kind of roll through it and I can show sure. you everything. 
Um, I don't know everything. I am learning. This is a, a large body of information to study and learn. So I will sure. be uh, upfront with everyone. Um, I am learning as I go. I do not know everything. And I do not assume to be some sort of master in this area yet. I, I think I am an apprentice in training. And I believe that it will take me several months or maybe another year to get to a point where I feel as though I really have a good mastery over this. Now, with that said, um, if you go to uh, Williams and Williams Law Firm .com, and you can go to up, up top is the different links. You can go to current and previous litigation. And then I'm going down to case number four. And then I clicked this link right here which is to view the PDF of the complaint, the summons, and the civil cover sheet. That pulls up this document here. Okay, and we can go through this. Yeah, and by the way, I had when you had posted that, I, I read through most of it, and, you know, wow, it's quite, it's quite the document, I have to say. I mean, as someone who's never filed a lawsuit, uh, I was learning a lot just from reading through it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's a tremendous amount of education and a tremendous amount of study that went into building that thing. I mean, years and years and years of study and and it's just kind of all building up to this this time period, right? So um this is the civil cover sheet. I, I don't know everything about this. Joey Kimbrough is the one who helps me with a lot of these things. Um, you know, you have some basic information, attorneys, you do just do pro se, which means no attorney. Um, and down on the nature of the suit, uh, with this one particularly is negotiable instruments, which is 140, uh, contract law. It's actually under contract law. So, uh, for those people who may not be familiar with our last show, um, what is a negotiable instrument? Um, you can go to UCC 3-104 to find out what is a negotiable instrument. A negotiable instrument uh, means an unconditional promise or order to pay a fixed amount of money. Okay, so Federal Reserve notes are actually promissory notes, which means they are actually negotiable instruments. Bills that get mailed to your house, those are actually bills of exchange. Um, and those are a bill of exchange is actually an unconditional order to pay. And you can see a lot of information about how this all breaks down on a video that I have on my Instagram. Uh, it's one of the pinned videos. And then also uh, on my YouTube channel, you can type in how to have infinite money in 10 minutes. And there's a very short 10 minute clip that covers how all of that works in terms of infinite money and in terms of negotiable instruments. Yeah. And um, I'll just mention that this is like, I would say to people that are trying to wrap their head around this that's foundational. Like once I started to really comprehend that we basically live in a world where we're not using money, we're using currency, which is negotiable instruments, which is a whole different animal. Yeah. Like a lot of doors started to open up in my mind and a lot of things started to make sense that, you know, for years and decades just didn't make sense at all. Yeah. If you go to uh, UCC3, it's very clear about this. So UCC3, as you can see here, um, UCC Article 3 is all about negotiable instruments. You can see right here. And UCC stands for the Uniform Commercial Code. If you go to subject matter, you can see here, it says here, this article, meaning Article 3, uh, applies to negotiable instruments. It does not apply to money. So the thing is, is that money is defined as gold and silver coins, and the actual definition says that it does not embrace notes, bills of exchange, or other evidences of debt. So UCC3 is about a completely different subject than money. That subject is called negotiable instruments. Negotiable instruments are only two things, an unconditional promise to pay or an unconditional order to pay, because those things are evidence of a debt. They're the two instruments that are evidence of a debt. Unconditional promise to pay, it shows that there is a debt there, or an unconditional order to pay, which shows there is a debt there. So basically, if I claim that you owe me money and I send you an unconditional order to pay and you don't rebut that unconditional order to pay, that unconditional order to pay is a bill of exchange or negotiable instrument and it has actual value in the weird crazy insane upside down world that we live in yeah 
Um, so this is a, a all of my lawsuits that you're going to see um, probably really forever. I don't really intend to go outside of this arena at all are all going to be negotiable instrument cases, right? So all of my cases of nature of suit are always going to be under the 140 contract negotiable instruments section, right? Uh, cite the U.S. statute under which you are filing. Um, this is 18 U.S.C. 1581 is the main statute. There are several that I'm filing under. So 18 U.S.C. 1581 is um, peonage. Mm. Peonage is, um, let's see here. Yeah, it's not defined here. You have to go to a different section. Let's see. You have to go to a different section for that. Uh, but peonage, right? It's debt slavery. That's what peonage means, okay? So that's the main cause of, it's called the cause of action. This is actually a very important term, right? So cause of action is basically like, the, the actual main core aspect of whatever it is that you're doing, the, the real cause of the action. You can have as many cause of action as you, causes of action as you want in a lawsuit. Um, each individual uh, alle alleged thing, which we'll get into in a moment, is considered a cause of action. You can look up more information about what that means online. Um, brief description of cause. Fraud involving endorsement of negotiable instruments, enticing plaintiff into debt, peonage, and slavery. That is the actual brief description of cause. And the only word here that hasn't been defined yet is endorsement. The word endorsement means um, basically it's the same idea as when you sign any promissory note or bill of exchange to either bring it into existence or to exchange it, which is called negotiation. So when you negotiate a, a negotiable instrument, what you write on the instrument itself in order to negotiate it, which means transfer it, uh, that, that of which you sign or that of which you write, those instructions, those orders, that is called a endorsement. And it's spelled I-N-D-O-R-S-E-M-E-N-T. When you're creating an instrument, as far as I can tell. And when you're receiving an instrument, it's spelled E-N-D-O-R-S-E-M-E-N-T, which is how you see it spelled on the back of your checks when you are depositing a check. If you notice that the um, the teller, when you when you when you sign or or endorse E-N-D-O-R-S-E-M-E-N-T, the back of your check, and you hand it to the teller, there's a there's a there's a, a stamp that they have. It's like a big yep. It's like with those big kind of rectangular looking things and it goes, right? You'll see it says accepted on there. There's certain terminology, right? This is all banking terminology. Um, them accepting the endorsement is also probably considered an endorsement. Um, so it's 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 all endorsement and, and, and negotiation. That's how all negotiable instruments are transferred, manufactured, moved, et cetera, right? So endorsement, Negotiation, endorsement, negotiation, endorsement, negotiation. That's exactly why a bill is called a bill of exchange. It has to do with negotiability, right? So um, going through all of this, uh, we're going to go on here. We have pictures of the original document with my chicken scratch handwriting. Yep. Um, I enclosed a check. It was a cashier's check. I believe it was a cashier's check for $405. That's how... This got started. Yeah. And like people, like, I just want to mention, I know you're going to get into the more details, but the reason why this law, like one of the main reasons why we, Brandon is even filing this or has filed this is because mo we do not, we are not properly interacting with these credit card companies. Like the, the relationship, we, we like most people don't understand. And I, I would used to be this way, but we don't understand the nature of the relationship that we have with these companies and what is actually happening in terms of gaining access to credit, whose credit it is, why we have access to it. So this is the foundation of why this lawsuit exists. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there's two types of, of, well, there's two main types. There's several different types. There's two main types of endorsement, right? So uh, I can go over that real quick, just for the newbies, the new people, you know, this might be pretty shocking. So if you go to, uh, let's see, UCC3, we're going to go down to 
3-205. So um, there's two major types of endorsement, right? a blank endorsement and a special endorsement, right? Now on the back of your, or on the front of your uh, promissory note that you sign for a mortgage or for a car or whatever, uh, you sign just your name. Yep. Now that's actually called a blank endorsement because it does not state the payee, right? So if we go back to UCC3. Almost like a blank check essentially. Yeah, so you're releasing that particular negotiable instrument without any conditions. Um, payable to bearer or order. Let's see here. Yeah. Um, so, so payable to bearer means payable to whoever wants it or whoever has it. The one who bears it. So the holder or the one who has it, right? The one who physically possesses it, right? So, so a promise or order is payable to bearer if it, and then point number two, does not state a payee. So when you sign a promissory note for a new car or when you sign a, a promissory note for uh, a dinner that you paid for on a credit card, which is a promissory note, by the way, you are manufacturing promissory notes every single time you get a loan, every single time you get a car financed, every single time you finance anything, every single time you put a credit card into a credit card machine, every single time you do any of those above actions, you are manufacturing an instrument and then you are negotiating that instrument by the way in which you sign, which is called endorse that instrument, okay? So if you just sign with your with your bullshit, your squiggler or your or your name, you are not stating the payee on the instrument. So the negotiability of that instrument becomes payable to anyone who wants it. Yep. A promise or order is payable to bear if it does not state a payee. So uh, the way that the banks do it, so you can get some idea of what it would look like uh, if you were to do what's called a special endorsement, which means that you are stating the payee and it's more clarified and it has more conditions attached to it. This is uh, a lot of bank documents for mortgages that we found, right? And you can see here, they do pay to the order of, so they state the payee. Uh, they say without recourse up top. So without recourse is a banking term or it's actually an endorsement term. So if you type in um, uh, a formula used to disclaim responsibility for future non-payment, especially of a negotiable financial instrument, right? So um, you can, bas you're basically saying, I, I don't have any responsibility for paying this anymore once you process this instrument. It's the greatest insurance in the world, writing without recourse. Writing without recourse on a new car or a new house, uh, writing without recourse on the promissory note means that you never, ever, ever legally have to make a payment on that note ever. So what do you think would happen, Brandon, if I was signing a mortgage hypothetically and I wrote without recourse in as on, if I endorsed it that way? There's so many people doing this now because what I teach is getting so big that the banks are starting to freak out. The banks can't really stop it. That's the funny thing, right? They think they can and they'll act as though they can and you can actually litigate and you will win uh, without recourse. They, they can't stop you from signing, from endorsing without recourse. That's that's coercion. That's all sorts of goofiness. They can't do that, right? So, uh, but but they're more and more are starting to catch on to this, um, you know, but the thing is, is that it's okay because the the more that, that people that catch on to this, the more people start asking lots of questions. Yeah. And the more people that are asking lots of questions, then then the faster this whole goofiness system just comes crumbling down like a bunch of hay. Um, but anyways, with a, I don't really want to destroy the system. I just know that's what's going to happen, by the way. I'm not some sort of anarchist, just in case anyone is wondering. I don't care. I really don't care. I don't, I don't, if, if, if the system stays around and I get infinite money, great. I don't care. Leave the system there. Leave the IRS there. Leave the, the federal reserve there. Leave the U S treasury just the way it is. I'm thrilled with the system the way it is. I could care less. I just know that as more and more people learn, I'm from the Midwest as more and more typical average blue collar Americans learn how the system works. They are not going to like it. Okay. It's just not an American thing. Okay, so I believe that the more people learn about this stuff, uh, the, the, this is this is all going to come crumbling down and it's going to go bye bye. Maybe not. 
And and I am not an anarchist. I am not attempting to destroy the banking system. I actually enjoy it very thoroughly. So just to be clear on that, but getting back to the endorsements here. Um, so you have without recourse, pay to the order of Wells Fargo Bank, comma, NA by B Y colon. Generally, there's a colon. This one doesn't have one, but generally it does. Line. That's where the actual signature takes place, right? So this whole thing is essentially an endorsement. And this part right here is basically the signature, right? And then below that, it's the name and title of the person of which is signing the byline. It's the person who is essentially creating this endorsement or or putting this endorsement on, on this particular negotiable instrument, right? Now, what you're doing in this situation is you're saying, you know, I, I have a full disclaimer of all future non-payment on this negotiable instrument. So you can't come back to me for any reason. Once you take it, that's it. The, it's called it's called ending negotiability. Uh, the negotiability is going to go to you, and then that's where the buck stops permanently. Uh, this is actually a negotiability term without recourse. Paid to the order of, you're stating the payee. It's the same wording you're going to see on a check. Your checkbook at home, it says paid to the order of. That is actually legal terminology for stating the payee of a negotiable instrument. A check is also a negotiable instrument. A check is actually called a bill of exchange because that check is an unconditional order to pay. Yep. So under paid to the order of, we have the name of the payee of this particular negotiable instrument, which is probably someone's mortgage. It's Wells Fargo Bank, comma, N-A. So when this particular negotiable instrument is swapped at the Federal Reserve window, the check that comes back for Federal Reserve notes is going to have as the payee, Wells Fargo Bank, comma, N dot A dot. Okay. Now, the way that works comes from 12 USC 412. It's also in the um, the Federal Reserve uh, the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, it's Section 16, Part 2. It's called yeah. Note Issues, right? But you can also find it in the United States Code under 12 USC 412, application for notes, collateral required, right? So this section teaches you that you can take uh, these promissory notes, for example, the original promissory note of your car, the original promissory note of a mortgage, the original promissory note that you created by putting your credit card into a credit card reader to buy gas. All of these things are actually called collateral securities, and what what the what the banking institution does is they write an application for notes and uh, Federal Reserve notes, which is what's in your wallet, and they take your uh, promissory notes, the ones that you've been manufacturing yourself and not stating a payee on. They claim the value of those notes by uh, putting their own special endorsement on it, like what you just saw, and then they write an application for notes and they, they they collateralize as collateral securities. They they turn those notes into collateral securities and they get better reserve notes for it. So let's say they for example, paid. They, they get paid. So they, they get beyond paid. They get paid the entire uh the entire maturity value of the of the negotiable instrument. So yeah. if you have a mortgage and it's $300,000 over 30 years at 5% interest, and the full value of the full note is actually $500,000. When they do the application for notes and they put the, the, the original mortgage note up for collateral, collateral security, they actually get paid the entire full value of the $500,000. So on a $300,000 loan, they're actually paid $500,000 up front, and then you pay them another $500,000. Now, does the Federal Reserve itself take over that collateral security? Is it is that the end of the line, or can it be you know tendered again as an as an instrument to gain more value? If you'd like to learn more about how to have this relationship or how this relationship works, anyone, as far as I know, can have a relationship with what's called the Federal Reserve Discount Window. Yep. You can go to uh, Federal Reserve discount window uh, account access and you can go down to um, 
I think I actually have it saved right here. Perfect. So this is the master account and services database. If you were to type this into Federal Reserve Discount Window, master account. There we go. So if you type that in, it'll come right up. Master account and services database. You can actually see that it shows you every single uh, existing window access. Uh, you can scroll through here and you can see every single bank, their main location. Are they federal deposit insured? Uh, if they are, what kind? Uh, you can see their location and you can see the date that they received Federal, federal Reserve discount window access. You can even type in something like American Express, which is what I did for my own lawsuit. Yep. And you can click here and you can click submit. And it will show you that uh, American Express National Bank uh, has had uh, Federal Reserve discount window access since October 17th, 1994. Uh, you will see this information in my lawsuit. Okay. Now, the way that you receive window access, which is actually located under the database requests for access. So this is all the different requests that are currently being processed or that have recently been processed by the Federal Reserve for discount window access. There is tier one access, tier two access, I believe, and tier three access. I don't know what all the differences are on those. This one has quite a bit more information, the action date, uh, the date it was submitted, and then the um, its current process. A lot of these are approved. This one is pending. Um, pending, pending, approved, approved, rejected. Custodia Bank Incorporated was rejected um, for tier three access. Uh, so you can actually go through here and you can locate everything. Now, the way that you get on this, this screen, this menu, is you file what's called an OC-10 agreement, which is basically essentially a, a collateral security agreement with the Federal Reserve. So you see here the Federal Reserve discount window payment system risk. You go down to OC-10 agreements, uh, agreement for U.S. borrowers or non-U.S. borrowers. So if you're a U.S. borrower or a non, uh, for me, it would be a non-U.S. borrower, right? So I would click here. And then this is the letter of agreement. That's and because then, Brandon is not a U.S. person. I know we've covered that in the past. So yeah. So yeah, and if I if I need to <laughs> yeah, and if I if I wanted to turn my all caps name or if I wanted to create some other corporation or trust, and if I wanted to naturalize that corporation or trust into the United States, I could do an OC10 agreement on behalf of that trust or organization, and I could have window access for a trust or a corporation or for myself or for whoever. Right, it, it all depends on what you want and how you want to set it up. Right. Uh, for people who are unfamiliar with naturalization, uh, just real quick, I'll cover that. 8 U.S.C. 1101, subsection A, 23. Yeah, this is really going to piss off people who've spent like seven to 10 years getting their, trying to get their U.S. citizenship, for example. Yeah, the term naturalization means the conferring of nationality of a state upon a person after birth by any means whatsoever. So it, it, during your citizenship, when you're getting your green card and you're going through all that, the very last step they have you do is a, a certificate of naturalization. You could have done that right at the beginning. You didn't need to go through all the green cards, all the other bullshit, all the hoops, all the tests, all that stuff is all pointless, stupid, and, and it's not illegal, but it's borderline illegal. Uh, naturalization is as simple as conferring the nationality of a state upon a person after birth by any means whatsoever. And ironically, Title VIII, the definition of the word person is a little bit more vague than the Internal Revenue Code. It means an individual or an organization. So any organization or individual, uh, it does not say the conferring of nationality of a state upon yourself after birth by any means whatsoever. It, it says conferring of nationality of a state upon an individual or organization, whether it's your own or someone else's, there's no specifics, after birth by any means whatsoever. This is how nationality is made. Nationality is made by simply saying it. 
If you say, if I confer, I am not doing that, by the way, right now, but if I was uh, conferring the nationality of Antarctica upon one of my trusts after birth, by any means whatsoever, that trust is now legally located in Antarctica instantly. Yep. So for my That's homies over... So for my homies over in Colombia, in South America, where I lived for a few years, that who were always clamoring, David, how can I get access? How can I get into the U.S.? How can I get access? Just give me a call, man. We'll work it out. We'll, we'll confer that by any means whatsoever. I mean, yeah, we're doing a lot of tests right now. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, the worst, worst, worst case scenario is we're going to have to litigate against the Department of State. But sure. done properly and done with a certificate of naturalization, which is just you just write it up, you just drop, you just write certificate of naturalization and you just type it in, you type in that uh, some kind of a statement and you notarize it. That's it. That's, That's all you means. need. That's and if you whatsoever. and if the Department of State will not issue you a passport based off that information. Um, I would go litigation. That's that's what I would do. Federal litigation. Uh, I would actually do. So there's a complaint and there's a petition. Yeah. A petition is when you're going to the court in order to force some business or person to take some sort of action. It's more of an action based lawsuit uh, for something like the, the Department of State. I would probably file a petition rather than a complaint. Okay. Because the thing is, is that the, the you, you want to force the Department of State through the court system to follow the law. The law says that if you confer the nationality of United States upon yourself or a person after birth by any means whatsoever, you become a national of the United States as per 8 U.S.C. 1101 subsection A22. A national of the United States means A, a citizen of the United States, or B, a person who, though not a citizen of the United States, owes permanent allegiance to the United States. And a couple other little interesting points. We have 22 CFR 51.2. People don't realize this. Passports may be, may be issued only to a U.S. national. There is not a single human being, man, woman, or child on the planet that has been issued a passport that is not a U.S. national. And citizenship is not required to be a U.S. national. You can also see at 22 U.S.C. 212, persons entitled to a passport, no passport shall be granted to, uh, no passport shall be granted or issued to or verified for any other persons than those owing allegiance, whether citizens or not, to the United States. So if you uh, pledge allegiance to the United States, you are legally uh, allowed to have a passport issued to you. And there's not really anything they can do about it. Um, so, and, and allegiance can be absolute and unqualified, or allegiance can be temporary and qualified. So for those people who don't like the idea of pledging allegiance to the United States, you can actually write up your own custom pledge of allegiance. And I've never really seen it be a problem with the Department of State. So you actually define what allegiance is within the confines of your own reality and your own contractual agreements. And you can write that up. And that would actually be your certificate of naturalization. Yeah, folks, it's it works way differently than 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 what we thought, what we've been taught. And I just wanted to clean up, since we're being so specific on words, I just wanted to clean up one thing that I should, probably should have mentioned earlier. We talk about the word anarchy and anarchist. There's a little confusion around that word. And I actually learned this. The word anar anarchy does not mean like someone who wants to create chaos. Anarchy comes from the Greek. It means an means without, and archi comes from Greek archon, which means a ruler or a master. So the word anarchy, all that means is no rulers, no masters, which is essentially what we're doing here. We're basically saying that there's no one that rules over us except for uh, God or creation itself. But there's no man, there's no human being or government agency that rules over us. So that's all it means by anarchy. Very good. Yeah. Good point. I, I, I use that maybe a little bit ignorantly. Um, well, I mean, but, to be fair, Brandon, I used to think the same way because through pop culture, as you know, I mean, part of the reason why we have so much confusion around all of these things that we're dealing with is because the entire pop culture slash, you know, education 
is teaching us incorrectly about all of these concepts. So it's like we're getting a crash course in how it actually works. Yeah. I'm having a hard time finding the actual main agreement. Uh, it's not very long. It's like maybe 10 pages. Are you, Most is that of something it, you plan to file at some point or I'm just curious? Yeah, definitely. Oh, definitely. Um, I will be doing that. Yeah. I'll be going down to the Los Angeles branch here and uh, I'm just going to meet, meet them and say hi and see if I can get a representative to, to talk with and just shake some hands. And then, yeah, I'll be filing an OC 10 agreement. Um, I don't know. Uh, the, the main agreement I'm clicking around, but being live on a show, I'm a little bit dispersed trying to figure out where it is. So anyways, if you go through all these files and all the stuff, you'll see one of these is the main, the main, main, main agreement. Almost all the agreement is what you can and can't do with all the collateral securities, how they're stored, yeah. how they're leveraged. That's most of what the OC 10 agreement covers, right? So once you have an OC 10 agreement, you're going to go on this page, which is the uh, database request for access page, and it'll be pending. And then once it's approved, uh, you will have access to follow 12 USC 412. And you can you can take uh, promissory notes or negotiable instruments and you can collateralize them. And you can write up an application for notes just like this. This is the endorsement that you're going to be placing on the documents. So for example, you can actually start giving out your own loans. Uh, and you would just write without recourse, pay to the order of Brandon Joe Williams Bank or whatever, or or Pickle Terry in National Bank or whatever it is you want to state as the payee, whatever the name of the bank account is that you have. By colon, I would sign my name here. Below that, I would put Brandon Joe Williams, senior president or president or whatever, right? And then that would be... Uh, the endorsement that I would use to swap that collateral security and collateralize that collateral security at the Federal Reserve window. You can see some more examples here, as well as here, as well as here. Um, it's always the same terminology. Um, you can see one here. Yeah, these signed documents have value in this system of negotiable instruments. That's the part I think that if if I were to emphasize what what I think people need to really incorporate, that's kind of the the you know the hard leap to take is these documents are the ones that have value in this system. Yeah, they have tremendous value. They have more value than the entire value of the original loan because they have the value of the entire maturity value of the entire loan. Yep. And what you said earlier, when someone's using a credit card, and this probably ties back to the lawsuit with Amex because they they you know, essentially is a credit card um, or a charge card. But the idea is every time you use that card, you're manufacturing a collateral security. You're manufacturing a promissory note. Yes, that's exactly right. right? So you're generating value. It's not like you're consuming someone else's loaned value that... The credit card company was like, oh, we'll give you, we'll temporarily give you some buying power that you have to pay back at the end of the month be, out of your own Federal Reserve notes. No, that's not how it works. You're actually no. manufacturing securities that they can then benefit from as well. Uh, but you're also supposed to benefit from them because you're the one who who generated them. Yeah, you are you are manufacturing a a, a negotiable instrument, which is a promissory note, which is a collateral security, right. and you are you are negotiating that particular collateral security with a blank endorsement, right? Which means anyone who grabs it and who wants to claim it, you're can like claim here, it. take it. Yeah, you're giving away free money, free free money. money. I mean, it's not money, but you know what I mean. Free. It's free currency. Free currency or funds. Current the the terms currency and funds. When you look up those two terms, they both say right in the definition that they do uh, encompass uh, evidences of debt, whereas the word money does not. So the word money would be gold and silver coins. Yeah. Negotiable instruments would be currency or funds. Those would be the terms that you would use in a legal in a legal way, right? So getting back to, you know, obviously my whole lawsuit is all about essentially, you know, I didn't know I was signing with a blank endorsement. No one told me this is this is. Bullshit, essentially. That's basically my whole lawsuit in a nutshell, right? So through fraud, I am turning back the clock and I am placing a special endorsement on every single negotiable instrument that has ever been manufactured on any of my accounts. And that is essentially the entire basis of my entire lawsuit. Okay, so we have 
you know, what area is it being filed? It's a civil action. It's not a criminal action. We have the plaintiff here. This is uh, my my Inslee just name, the all caps name, and I have a registered trademark, so it has the registered trademark symbol. Uh, that is the person who is the plaintiff, okay, versus, and we have two defendants. We have American Express Company and American Express Cabbage Incorporated, okay? And you can always add more parties as you go forward. For example, after you get through the initial what's called flurry of motions, which I'll show you if we have time, uh, you can always add defendants. You can always add causes of action. When you get into discovery, you can start asking for them to produce documents. You can start asking asking questions under penalties of perjury. You can start doing all sorts of fun things. And if you find, let's say, for example, that the bank, uh, American Express National Bank, which we saw on the uh, Federal Reserve discount window uh, website, yeah. let's say I want to drag them in as a party. You can always add parties later. So this doesn't need to be perfect. You don't need to make everything perfect. You just need to make it pretty good and get the ball rolling. And then you can always add parties and do all sorts of fun things later, right? So this is the summons. This basically the way that the summons works is is when you when you send everything into the court, you send this summons. So so the way that everything works in litigation, it's very simple. You do all the work for them. And you can complain about that. You can bitch and moan. It ain't gonna make no difference. That's the way it's done. The, the judges have 600 cases that they're operating and they have they have magistrate uh, intermediary judges that work underneath them. They have a lot going on with all the stuff that we're doing. There's going to be 10 times more traffic in the courts because of all the lawsuits that people are going to be filing here pretty soon. So the thing is, is that you need to make the job of the people in the courts as easy and as rapid and as simple as possible. Even beyond that, that's just the way it's done. So... This is a summons. You would think, oh, the court made this. No, we made it. The way that everything works in a court system is very, very simple. You write up everything as if they wrote it. And then all they have to do is just sign it. That's how the court systems work. So every single order, every single motion, every single everything is a proposed order or proposed motion. I write the whole thing for the judge and on all the judge has to do if he approves it is just choop, sign it. So in a summons, the clerk or deputy clerk is the one who signs it. So the deputy clerk or clerk gets your parcel. They look over all the documents. They look over everything and then they say, okay, good. He's paid. Good. He's got a complaint. Good. Everything looks good. There's the defendants. There's the plaintiff. The structure looks pretty good. The, the basic overlay of the entire court case looks pretty good. Okay. This looks pretty good. Then they, they deposit your check, which in federal court is $405. And then they sign the summons and they send the summons back to you. You have to deliver the summons. Now you yourself cannot deliver the summons. It has to be a, a non-party to the case that delivers the summons. So it can't be one of the plaintiffs. A process now, server. A process server is the easiest thing that you can do. So the one that I use, and they're going to be very happy with my little plug here, um, because we just started using them. We, I believe, yeah, we use ABC Legal. And we just started using them. So if people have bad experiences or something, I don't fucking know. I don't want to fucking hear it. I don't give a fuck. Okay, so I'm I'm using ABC Legal right now. It's like 80 bucks. If they fuck up, then I'll fire them and find somebody else. There's not there's no lack of process servers that they are probably out there. have a national scope, I would imagine. They do. They have a national scope, right? So you just start working with the process server if you want, right? We we were we were serving everything through the mail and it's a pain in the ass. It doesn't work that well. We we tried for a lot of time to do that. And we just gave up on that because it's really a pain in the ass. I do recommend you use a process server at this point. Okay. I wouldn't have told you that two months ago. Uh, but at this point, it's just, it's going to save you a lot of grief. I assure you. I'm wondering but, now if you can use a process server to pro to deliver a conditional acceptance letter, like even outside of the court system. Well, yeah, but the whole thing is, is that again, enforcement, it's all enforcement. Yeah. Do you want to pay a process server to, to serve documents that don't mean shit? Then sure. You're basically just bluffing at that point. Okay. 
Well, I'm not entirely sure that the conditional accept, I mean, the conditional accept itself is not going to have enforcement unless there's something behind it, but that would be the claim of lien or the, or the lawsuit. Yeah. So a lawsuit, you can see here, this is the same wording. Generally, always a lawsuit has been filed against you. You have 21 days, not counting the day it was served or 60 days. If you are the United States or United States agency or an officer or employee of the United States described in blah, blah, blah. So, so generally speaking, they have 21 days. Okay. So, so what you do is you, you hire a process server, you get these all sent out. Now the process server is going to write up an affidavit stating, you know, I went to this particular location. Uh, there was a receptionist or whatever. I gave them the the parcel and they signed for the parcel. Here's the signature or whatever. It's like a little, it's like a simple little thing that says that they delivered and served the documentation, right? Now, when you get that service of process affidavit back from the process server, you file that service of process affidavit into the court, into your lawsuit, and then boom, the 21-day countdown window has begun. If they fail to respond within 21 days, you can file what's called a motion for default judgment or summary judgment or whatever, probably default judgment. And you can say, you know, they have failed to respond within 21 days, and then you can be awarded your lawsuit just literally that easily. It's that easy. Okay. But now, I would imagine American Express has already made some kind of a response. Of course. Uh, we can maybe get into all that. Um, I, I have another hour with you. So yeah. uh, if you want to get into the docket in, in terms of all the different things that have happened in the lawsuit, it might take some time, but let's see what we can get through here. So this is the proof of summons. This is like a, a basic form that can be filled out, you know, uh, by the person who's 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 delivering it, right? Uh, server signature, printed name and title, server's address, or they can just write up an affidavit. Affidavit just means a, a sworn under oath, just whatever, just information that is sworn under penalty of perjury is is the definition of an affidavit. Okay. So they're basically swearing, I hand delivered these documents to the following individual at this location. Yep. That's called service of process. Yeah. So after they get that done, um, then now they have 21 days and then now all sorts of goofiness begins, which we're not going to get into quite yet. We're going to go through the actual complaint, right? So we have the summons for the both parties. We have two parties, two defendants. The definition of the word party is, is somebody who's listed on there, like whether it be a plaintiff or defendant or whatever. Right. So, um, uh, the non-party would be somebody who has nothing to do with anything. Like if you're subpoenaing some other company for information to the courts, they would really like be a witness, a, essentially. They'd be a non-party, as far as I know. Yeah, I'm still learning a lot of this stuff, though. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Uh, so here is the actual complaint itself. Okay, so at the top, we have the court. We have the plaintiff. Um, we have the two defendants. We have the fact that um, this was stamped by the clerk. Because that they they received my payment and the, the check went through, so she I'm assuming she because they're almost always a woman, but that's you know I'm assuming that uh, she uh, wrote all this on here and stamped all this and and e e e is her initials or whatever um, the deputy right and then uh, she wrote the uh, case number cause number right now uh, the beginning is just a bunch of kind of for, form formal formalities comes now person Brandon Joe Williams. Uh, all caps registered trademark presented by man, Brandon Joe Williams. Now, I know a lot of people who are into the sovereignty space, they want to go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And they want to write nine pages about who they are and what this thing is and all this stuff. It's all a waste of time. You're wasting the course time. Person, Brandon Joe Williams presented by man, Brandon Joe Williams. Very simple. That's it. You don't need to say anything just more. Just drawing a distinction. You're saying I'm the living man. And the, I'm, you know, through this, a person, which is the, the public corporation, the ends legis, that's, that's how I'm maneuvering through the legal system. Yes. You can, you can maneuver this thing, this person, Brandon J. Williams in all capital letters, you move him around simply by conferring the nationality of a state upon a person after birth by any means whatsoever, which you're going to see a little bit later in this lawsuit. Okay. So uh, files this complaint against defendant, and then it has that one. And then and then this little section, the quote, annex quote, 
That just means that this particular name, American Express Company, from this point forward will now be called this name, sure. A-M-E-X in all capital letters. And defendant, American Express Cabbage Incorporated, which will from this point forward be called just Cabbage. Collectively referred to as defendants and alleges uh, upon information and belief the following. Now, the definition of the word allege is the most important thing in all of complaints. The definition of the word allege means setting forth that of which you intend to prove. You don't necessarily have to prove anything until you get into what's called discovery, which is later. Discovery is where all the evidence collection and 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 evidence digging and all the all the good stuff and all the all all the craziness happens in in discovery. So you are alleging these things, which means that you are stating them with the intent to prove everything that you state later. Yep. People go on and on and on for 450 pages on their complaint and they submit, you know, a 70 pound stack of papers. Uh, the court, the court cannot handle that. Yeah, that is, that you is just going have to get to know that you can't. That if you are called upon to prove something that you're yes. alleging, that you can do that. Yes. So, so you will do that later in discovery, and if you're called upon to do that, you will do it later. And I'll tell you right now, if you allege things that you know you can't prove, you are setting yourself up for a complete disaster, oblivion, smoke, fire, and brimstone. But you are not currently attempting to prove you are simply alleging at the beginning of a complaint at the complaint level the complaint is general allegations and specific allegations it is not evidence it's probably smart to have evidence ready to go before you file a complaint but you don't necessarily need that either because in discovery, you're going to get access to subpoenas. You're going to get in access to interrogatories. You're going to get access to depositions, which is where you put someone in some cold, dark room and you put a hot lamp on their face and you videotape them and they put their hand up under penalty of going to fucking prison. And then you can interrogate the fuck out of them on camera. And it's absolutely glorious. There's a lot of information and evidence that you will have access to collect. The way that I describe discovery is when you motion the court into discovery, which comes later, it's like the judge is going to issue you a badge, a gun, and a shovel. The amount of evidence that you may have may not be that great, but when you get into discovery and you are issued your badge, your gun, and your shovel, you will have access to dig up all the evidence that you... So, so you should at least be damn sure that what you're alleging, you can dig up the evidence required in discovery. You don't and need you don't to, want to make shit up, up front here just because you th you think you're going to be able to pull yeah. one over. Make it making shit up and you you can get sanctions, you can get frivolous uh lawsuits, uh frivolous filings. Generally speaking, you're just going to get fines, maybe 5, 10,000 per infraction, but the the very very worst you can be imprisoned. Uh, that's pretty that's pretty rare. Um you usually only see that in 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 truly hostile truly fictitious filings that are made purely for some sort of harassment purpose. It can get so bad that you can see prison time. Uh, you would have to really fuck this up to a, a, an absolutely unbelievable level, but the idea of getting sanctioned for monetary damages or something like that would be more common. Okay. So here's the introduction. Um, this is me just saying, look, you know, I, I've, I, I know you guys see a lot of pro se people, most of them are pretty annoying and horrible. Please don't put me in that category. Okay. Uh, that's all I'm trying to say there. Okay. And a lot of people have copied this section and they've done, they've used this same section for their lawsuits. I don't necessarily recommend that uh, if it's not real for you. Um, you know, just make sure that whatever you write here is, is really truly real for you. And um, yeah, I mean, you don't usually see stuff like that at the beginning of a lawsuit. I put that there just because I just didn't want there to be any sort of prejudice because I am pro se. Uh, I've seen a lot of pro se stuff myself. I've looked over a lot of court cases. They're pretty awful. So I understand that the court is exhausted and annoyed um, by pro se litigants in general. And I was just trying to defend myself against that as best I can. So that's why I wrote that. Okay. Good idea. Uh, I study all the local rules or, or it's kind of a slow process, but I have the California local rules here. 
It's a lot. Um, most lawyers don't even know these rules. These rules are considered law. You should take the time to slowly begin consumption of these various, it's not too much. You can see it's very, very big print. And you can see um, that the first several sections is just the table of contents. So it starts like right around here. Uh, and you can see it's very, very large lettering. So you can see, um, but it does go on for quite some time. There's a lot of local rules. For example, in California, whenever you file a motion, which means moving the court into a new section, such as discovery or whatever, uh, you do have to have what's called a meet and confer with the other parties. That's all located in the local rules section of your local. You should study these. Um, if you fuck these up, uh, a pro se litigants, by the way, they actually legally in the court systems have more leniency than than attorneys at law. Now, that's actually as per actual law. So you do have additional leniency to fuck up some things and to fuck up some of the local rules, but only some leniency. You have the right to bend certain things a little bit, but you do not Almost have like a handicap. Like if you were, playing... you have a little bit of a handicap as a pro se litigant, which is a huge benefit, by the way. I love pro se is the way to go, hundred percent. But um, it does not mean you can go. If I had to give it a percentage, just out of my ass, I don't have a ton of experience. I'd say you have like a 15 percent leeway. Yeah, it's not leeway to do whatever the fuck you want. That's yeah, called disrespect. Ultimately, when you file a lawsuit, you are entering, you know, it's called court. Think of it like a game analogy. You are going on to the court to play. When we play sports or any game, you don't just go on to the, to the basketball court and like, oh, I'm going to make up my own rules here. You'd get kicked exactly. off. The other players would you like say, get the fuck out of here. Or they would just start beating you up, you know, or kick you off the, the court. So it's the same thing here. I mean, if you're going to go into court. You're going to follow the process of the court. It's that simple. Otherwise, don't go there. Yeah. And the cool thing about being pro se is that uh, if you fuck up some of these rules a little bit, uh, you can you can you can kind of scoot around it and you can survive. If the if the lawyers, if the attorneys at, at law uh, fuck up with the local rules or the federal rules, uh, you can jump all over them and rip them apart limb by limb. So it's, it is, it is a bit of a handicap that's that, that, that actually works in your favor. So for federal court, which is where I do all my stuff, cause it's all federal cause negotiable instruments operates the same across the whole landscape of North America. So it's a federal claim. Uh, you would study the federal rules of civil procedure. Now, again, it's a lot. Uh, I do personally recommend that you maybe read this in bites. I do not, you don't necessarily need to read all of this. Um, if you if you walk through the court with your hat in your hand and you're very kind and you're very trying to learn, uh, it's possible that they may help you some of the way. The, the main issue you're going to run into is they're going to keep telling you, we can't give you legal advice. Legal advice is legally defined as giving you exact and specific opinions or ideas about your exact and specific personal situation. That is the legal definition. So if you ask, um, what should I do? I was robbed. What should I file? That could be considered uh, legal advice. But if you say, hypothetically, let's say there was a guy and he was robbing a 7-Eleven, what statute could 7-Eleven use to file a lawsuit on the guy robbing that now that that technically wouldn't really be legal advice because legal advice is literally it has to involve your personal situation correct so if you ask questions of the court that involves a personal situation or your personal lawsuit typically unless you've kind of you know it's some cute girl and you've kind of rizzed her up and she's ready to go Besides that, typically they're going to tell you they cannot give you legal advice. And that's true. It's very serious, very, very serious. They cannot give you legal advice. They cannot give you any 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 sort of legal. If you want legal advice, by the way, um, if you want uh, uh, to really learn this stuff uh, in the fastest and most exciting way possible, in my opinion, what you want to do is you want to look up a uh, local law library. OK, uh, someplace near you, um, ideally someplace in a big city. OK, uh, California Courts has a self-help section. 
right? Self-help guide, law libraries. Now you can you can chant with a law librarian. Now I'll tell you right now, law librarians can't give you legal advice, right? What is the definition? The legal definition. But if you're of, kind to them, sure, they'll be helpful as much as they can outside of giving you legal advice. So legal advice is any written or oral guidance regarding a specific legal matter that impacts the rights and responsibilities of the person who receives it. Okay. So... in relation to a particular factual situation. So, so giving like, someone hey, so like, giving like, someone how... generic yeah. formal opinion, which is what I'm doing on this show, yeah. would not legally be considered legal advice. Not that I give a fuck. People are always like, you can always tell amateurs in my opinion because they always go, this is not legal advice. I don't give a fuck if it is or not because I don't live in the United States and I don't live in the state of California. So it doesn't matter if it's legal advice or not, because I wouldn't be underneath any statute that would hurt me or harm me or hit me for giving legal advice. I'll give legal advice all day on a fucking soapbox or on the internet. I'll give legal advice all day. I'll give, I'll give legal advice on a 24 hour fucking broadcast. I don't give a fuck. But besides that legal advice itself actually has an actual definition so it's in relation to a particular factual situation. So technically on this show, I am not giving legal advice. Now, if you said, Brandon, I have this particular situation, what would you do in my situation? Now, that would be legal advice. And I would definitely for sure answer that question and give you legal advice because I don't give a fuck because I'm not in the United States. So it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Now, with that said, going back to law libraries, a law librarian can't necessarily give you legal advice, but a law librarian can help you navigate procedure. You see the difference? So it's like, I, I want to file this lawsuit. You wouldn't say like, like, how do I, you know, like, how would I word how this do I structure my cause term. of action? Right. You would say, what aspects of this do I need in order to get my cause of action filed? You see the difference? That's a procedural question. Yeah. Now, these law librarians are probably fucking sexy, first off. So for most men that are out there, this is fucking literally the greatest thing since sliced bread. Second thing is I've that's had a, that's so, an incentive to go file a lawsuit right there. I've had so many reports, <laughs> so many reports all over the country of these like lonely law librarians that no one ever fucking comes and sees that no one ever fucking calls to the point where you show up and there's like three of them that are all helping you and they're all babes and they're all like excited that you're there they're like fucking thrilled they finally have a purpose in life no one ever fucking calls no one ever comes in like we're talking literally like a fucking dream we're talking like i'm about ready to go in there i thought about going in there just for the fuck of it and just pretending like i'm an idiot i don't know i'm telling Brandon, you, i've changed my mind i'm going to law library tomorrow <laughs> to start doing some research <laughs> i am so fucking dead serious anyone out there i mean I imagine it's probably like 90% female from all the reports that I've gotten. I don't think I've even heard of a male law librarian. Uh, if you're if you're a woman, if you're a lesbian, go for it. If you just want to make a new friend, if you just want advice, uh, you know, for me being a dude, I love women. I mean, it's 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 brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, they will help you with all of the procedural aspects that you need to learn. And I believe it's all free. It doesn't yep. get any better than this. It doesn't get any better than this. It doesn't. Yeah, you babes, guys might meet your babe. Your lo local, babe. you see the fucking ads when you're looking at porn. You know, local babes want to fucking meet you. Blah blah. Local babes want to meet you. They're called law librarians. They actually want to meet you. Shockingly, you think no one wants to meet you. These girls want to fucking meet you. Okay. So call your local law library, drive an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, stay in a hotel, do whatever you have to do. If you really want to go down this road, 
They will help you with all of the procedural aspects of how all of this works. They will, it will be probably a borderline sexual experience for them to finally have someone to actually assist and probably twiddling their thumbs. And people don't become law librarians because they just want to sit around and do nothing. No. I've never once had a report of a law librarian being like, God damn it. There's somebody here who actually wants to see me. They are like doing fucking backflips over the idea that you are there. Okay. So and then you must've made a couple of law librarians very happy. Yes. Law librarians are, I mean, I've never met one, uh, which is <laughs> sad as fuck, but they're, they're, they're some of the best people for, for all of this. This is the, this is the greatest thing that ever happened. Okay. So with that said, um, going back to the complaint. Okay. So, so we have jurisdiction and venue. Okay, now this is the most important thing. The first thing the courts want to know is, do we have jurisdiction and what is the jurisdiction? If they don't have jurisdiction, they don't want to, they don't want to fuck with it. They don't want to have anything to do with it. They're going to throw the case out immediately. Everyone thinks that we live in a lawless society. We don't. If they don't think they have jurisdiction, they'll throw everything out instantly. They don't fuck around with that. Okay. Uh, you're going to write down how and why jurisdiction and the various locations. Now, mine is very different than what you're going to normally see. You see here through the power of naturalization found in 8 U.S.C. 1101 subsection A23. Human name Brandon Joe Williams confers the nationality of the state called State of California on all caps. Brandon Joe Williams registered trademark after birth by any means whatsoever. This satisfies the jurisdictional requirements of the court. So I'm moving the public corporation into state of California through the power of naturalization. Okay. Because the, the ends legis is the actual plaintiff. Okay. Yeah. And the federal the court that you're filing it is in California. State of California. State of yes. California. Right. So uh, plaintiff, blah, blah, blah. We have some, some information on the parties. This is involving the parties and the jurisdictional aspect of the parties. And then here, here we here it begins. General factual allegations setting forth facts of which i intend on proving later this is the juicy ribeye steak part of it so this is where the actual points start right yeah. now you, you can see the way a lawsuit is filed is every single piece of information on the lawsuit is all numbered yeah. so you have all the different numbers so let's say for example i have a question about number seven it's very very easy to navigate uh, responding to this or talking about this because you just say on the original complaint, uh, paragraph number seven, yeah. and then everyone can very, very rapidly locate that. Every single point of everything all the way down this whole lawsuit, I believe it goes like 150 or something on this one, uh, 156. So every single point is numbered. That way it can be easily located. Some of them are just like one sentence, but we separate them out. So every allegation is its own item. Mm -hmm. Right. Instead of trying to combine things together. Now, what happens is when you file this, they have to answer this. Right. And they're going to they're going to especially with something this crazy. They're going to fight like hell to try and answer it. They're going to file a, a, a motion to dismiss right away. And they're just going to flail like 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 drowning animals because they don't want to have to respond to something this deadly. Right. But the, generally speaking, the way that uh, a complaint is 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 answered, as long as they are willing to answer it, if they're not, they'll freak out and they do what's called the flurry of motions, which is where they try to freak out and, and dismiss the case or whatever. But once you get past that, which is that's where I'm at right now with this whole case, once we get past that, they have to answer the complaint. Um, answering the complaint, the way that the answer works is every single now a lot of attorneys are stupid. And they don't do it this way, but they should. The way that an, you, you're supposed to answer is every single paragraph item is supposed to be responded with. So it would be a response would say answer to complaint. And then it'd say 10. And then it'll say either affirmed, denied, or I don't know. So affirmed, affirmed, denied, I don't know, affirmed, denied. So let's say you have a long ass point number 14 and it goes on and on and on and on and on. If they can deny any particular point inside of number 14, they can write denied on all of number 14, even though number 14 had four or five items in it. That's why what you want to do is you want to write each individual paragraph with just one item per paragraph. 
So like I could write all of this in one item. All of these first four are, could be all one item. It makes sense that it would be one item. No, because if then if any of the four points are incorrect, all the entire item can be written denied. Yeah. And when so I was you writing, want this to be in yeah. teeny tiny itty bitty little bite sized pieces. That way they have to say affirmed, denied, or I don't know for every single crumb. That's the way I write mine. And that's the way I would recommend typically people write theirs. Okay. Yeah. So the first item is that when you look at the bills that come to me from, from American Express, the name on those bills is Brandon J. Williams, all caps. Yep. So I put on here, Brandon J. Williams had cabbage loan number. Brandon J. Williams had cabbage loan number. Brandon J. Williams had MX account number. Brandon J. Williams had MX account number. Now, if Brandon J. Williams had those Amex accounts with those numbers, they would put affirmed, 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 affirmed. That's the answer. Now, the cool thing about that is they're answering affirmed to an allegation. Yeah. When they answer affirmed to an allegation, they've already proven that allegation. You don't need to prove it. That's the beauty of it. Anything you think you can prove in discovery, if they say affirmed, you've already proved it. You don't need to now in discovery. And the thing is, is that if they say deny to something they know was true, that's called perjury. Yep. And they're fucked. You can motion the court for sanctions for perjury. They're fucked either yep. way. Yeah. So the thing is, is this is how you apply pressure. You're applying pressure. You want to apply the maximum amount of pressure possible. Okay. Now I'm no pro. I haven't won anything. These are massive cases. It may be years before I win something. Take everything that I am teaching on this show with a grain of salt. Uh, do your research. Look around. Uh, I think in a couple of years, I'll be a real pro at this. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm on a hundred percent sure that everything that I'm teaching you from my end of the spectrum is the best information you're going to find anywhere. Cause that took me a long time to figure all this out myself, but I, I'm not a case slayer. I'm not winning cases left and right. You know, these cases yeah. are very, very slow. They drag on and on and on forever. They're the, 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 the attorneys, you know, I don't know if we're going to have a chance to look at all the docket, uh, on the show, but the attorneys are just. Sure, they're, they're, they're going off around. on they, they're they're doing reputational attacks and they're going yeah, to my website hominem. and just oh they're just so irrelevant they're they're so so off the deep end like i'm speaking about uh the santa monica pier and they're talking about the glaciers in antarctica literally like it's like it's so irrelevant it's unbelievable but that's just because they are scared to death to answer this complaint yeah. They would rather the die than answer this complaint. Here's a, here's a point I'll just share in context, you know, because I obviously in my work in terms of teaching natural law, which common law derives from, and, and just let's just say, let me just put it this way. If you are speaking the truth, then that is just knowing that you're speaking the truth, that has a certain power to it. And yes, they're oh, going to yeah. fight it. Yes, they're going to, you know, the the liars and the and the frauds are going to, you know, obviously they're going to fight it. But ultimately, when you are speaking the truth, you have truth, you have the truth on your side. And and I, you know, my experience is that ultimately prevails. Oh, 100 yeah. percent. That's why angels always have swords and in, in, in yeah. pictures. You know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, so, so, so ends legis means a creature of the law, an artificial being as contrasted with a natural person applied yeah. to corporations considered as deriving their existence entirely from the law. Now, if we go back to where we were at here, we have the first four, which is very simple. Just this particular person had these particular accounts. Okay. Number 14. Ensley just named Brandon J. Williams and Brandon Joe Williams registered trademark are both referring to the same person. Now, if they say denied on this, I'm going to jump all over them. Who is this person? Who is that person? What kind of structure are they? How do you prove it? Where are they? You, know, you just jump all over them. 
If they say affirmed, that's it. We're done. It's proven. It is now a proven fact in law, in this lawsuit. Next item, number 15. Brandon and Joe Williams registered trademark. Uh, trademark serial number is, and then there's a particular number there, right? Number 16, Brandon Joe Williams registered trademark. Trademark is held by Brandon Joe Williams. Now they have to say affirm, denied, or I don't know on each of these for the answer, right? Brandon Joe Williams is the representative for Brandon Joe Williams registered trademark. Brandon Joe Williams gave permission to Amex to access and use the credit of all caps Brandon Joe Williams registered trademark. Improper performance was made on these accounts by extraneous and unnecessary Federal Reserve notes being used to pay the accounts. That, that one's that a little bit more so important. That's the cru that's like crux right there. That, that yeah. When you send in those federal those quote unquote payments, that is not proper performance on these accounts. Yeah. So the definition of payment, the legal definition of the word payment. Mm, I hope I have it here. Ho folks who have been following this conversation, hopefully you guys already know this, but I know this is going to be new for some people. Payment. The definition of payment is the fulfillment of a promise or the performance of an agreement. Yeah. Since promissory notes and bills of exchange have intrinsic value as negotiable instruments, by negotiating them and sending them back, you are fulfilling the performance of an agreement. That is how the world really works. You are actually failing to make a payment every time you send in Federal Reserve notes which they clean up on the back end and then they kind of snicker in amongst each other as they collect, as they double collect on payment. Well, no one really knows any of that, but yes, yeah. essentially, I don't think anyone really has any clue they're doing that, but yes. So, so going back to this, um, number 20 proper performance or meaning proper payment, meaning payment would have been to endorse the original collateral securities under special negotiation prior to them being exchanged for federal reserve notes. Brandon Joe Williams failed to do a special endorsement on the original collateral securities. Had Brandon Joe Williams known, comma, Brandon Joe Williams would have done special endorsements on those collateral securities all the way from the beginning. Brandon Joe Williams never intended to do any blank endorsements on behalf of all caps Brandon Joe Williams registered trademark. Proper performance is done primarily through clear orders and special endorsements. Improper performance is done via blank endorsements and lack of orders. Proper performance balances the accounting. Improper performance unbalances the accounting. There were many promissory notes made on these accounts. Each individual credit transaction produced an unconditional promise to pay. Do you see how I'm writing this? They would it's like, be it's like fools. you're breaking down the story step by They would step. be fools to write I don't know or denied. Yeah. I will I will I will crush their entire lineage if they write denied or I don't know on these. You're writing it in a way where they don't have a choice. They can only write affirmed. There's nothing else that, that we can talk about it if you want, but you, you, I'm writing this in a way where it's just affirmed, affirmed, affirmed. And if I see it denied, I am going to just absolutely flay their skin, metaphorically speaking, of course. So each individual credit transaction produced an unconditional promise to pay. Yep. A promissory note is an unconditional promise to pay. The promissory notes are negotiable instruments. Promissory note and note mean the same thing. Federal Reserve notes are promissory notes. Federal Reserve notes are negotiable instruments. All promissory notes are collateral securities in accordance with 12 USC 412. Each month, there was a billing statement generated on the above accounts. A, quote, billing statement, end quote, is an unconditional order to pay. A billing statement or bill or any similar language is another term to describe a bill of exchange. An unconditional order to pay is a bill of exchange. Now, I'm setting forth and I intend to prove all of this. It's very, 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 very easy to prove all of this in UCC Article 3. UCC Article 3 says all of these things in basically almost the same terminology. So, so I am alleging that of which I intend to prove. And if they would like me to prove anything, 
I will simply pull up UCC3 and show them the proof of every single one of these items. It's very, very easy. A bill of exchange is a negotiable instrument. Bills of exchange are collateral securities in accordance with 12 USC 412. All promissory notes produced by uh, all caps brand and Joe Williams registered trademark are under the purview of 18 USC 8. Now, what is 18 USC 8? USC 8. Obligation or other security of the United States. So basically, it's just saying that literally almost everything under the sun, when it stars, all bonds, certificate of indebtedness, national bank currency, Federal Reserve notes, Federal Bank notes, Federal Reserve Bank notes, coupons, uh, United States notes, Treasury notes, gold certificates, silver certificates, fractional notes, certificates of deposits, bills, checks, drafts are all obligations or other securities of the United States. Yeah, so another way saying, to say this is you don't your ass doesn't own owe anything. Yeah, it's all it's all uh, uh, all bills are all bills for the United States to handle. They got you got by thinking you're a debt slave, but you ain't no such thing. Yeah, the, the United States is actually the debt slave. So the next point is all bills of exchange sent to Brandon Joe Williams registered trademark are under the purview of 18 USC 8. Uh, all cats brand Joe Williams registered trademark is able to legally create currency because it is a federal reserve member bank. This one they'll probably say denied to, which we can talk to. We can talk about that. No problem. Uh, I intend to prove that as to the best of my ability, which we can subpoena the federal reserve for information. You can subpoena third parties to the court. You write up the subpoena and then you write up a, a, a proposed order for subpoena and you submit that into the judge. And if the judge signs it, you now have a legal subpoena and you can actually issue that subpoena to the federal reserve or to any company. And by law, they have to provide the information that has been requested on the subpoena. So if we want to go in that direction for point number 44, that's exactly what we will do. Number 45, the Federal Reserve Bank is the custodian to pay on behalf of obligations or other securities of the United States. And then here's here's where we start getting into. Now, that's like the backstory and the definitions, which is factual allegations. I am alleging that these are pieces of information or facts or definitions. And if we need to prove those later, I intend to prove those entirely later on at any point in time that it's requested. Okay. Now, at this point, we're going to start getting into what occurred. Okay. A conditional acceptance was accepted for delivery on June 7th, 2022 at 10, 12 a.m. The conditional acceptance was hand signed for by agent Thomas Severe. Thomas Severe signed for the parcel by hand with a black pen. I have evidence because the PS 3811, uh, yeah. the green card came back to me. I have it here in physical form. And I also scanned it into my computer to make sure I have a digital backup copy. So if, you know, I didn't send all that in to the court with the complaint, but I am ready to prove this allegation whenever the time arises that I must do so. Right now, I am simply alleging that Thomas Severe signed for the parcel by hand with a black pen. Later on, uh, what if what if uh, I submitted my PS3811 and he actually signed with a blue pen? Then number 48 would be denied at that point. Number 48 would be incorrect because he did not sign with a black pen. He signed with a blue pen. It's got to be precise. It's got to be precise. Number 49, the conditional acceptance uh, was using the 1099A IRS form for payment. Uh, number 50, the IRS 1099A form is an unconditional order to pay. Uh, number 51, the IRS 1099A form is a bill of exchange. Now, um, th this is actually an interesting conversation. I would love to speak more about this. I would love to subpoena uh, the IRS or subpoena, you know, whoever I need to subpoena or talk more with the defense about this to find out exactly how it is a, f a bill of exchange and kind of fill all that in. So if the defense decides they want to challenge that in some way, I would actually love to have that conversation and speak more about that. Um, I am, I am 95% sure that the IRS 1099A form is a bill of exchange. Uh, I would probably need to do a little bit of activities in discovery in order to completely uh, establish that. It's not a major, major aspect of this court case uh, because I've already, through fraud, changed all of the endorsements on all of the instruments to a special endorsement. So it's just kind of like a bonus. It's not really 
super, super critical um, for this case to move forward. But uh, it's something that I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty damn sure uh, if we have a conversation about it, that I'd be able to establish this, this fact. Okay. Uh, three different 1099A forms were submitted to pay the entire amounts of all the above accounts. The next conditional acceptance was sent to both the CEO and the legal department. Legal department signed to receive the parcel on this date and time. The CEO's copy was signed to be received at this date and time. Uh, what what was it? The second conditional acceptance was a threat for liens uh, due to my payment not being applied to my accounts for my first conditional acceptance. Uh, on May 15th, uh, Jonathan uh, Peretta signed for that one. He signed uh, by hand with a blue pen that time. In the first parcel, uh, this is a whole whole other series of parcels. Uh, the, in the first parcel, uh, Brandon J. Williams was claiming titles, rights, interest, and equity owed to Brandon J. Williams. Uh, the first parcel included a power of attorney, POA, outlining the relationship between Brandon J. Williams and all caps Brandon J. Williams registered trademark. Uh, then the next one, we have the second of the total of three parcels that were signed. Uh, that one had similar wording that was signed for by the black pan, blah, 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 blah. We're going to skip these. Um, um, we have here, in essence, what Brandon Joe Williams has been trying to do all this time is simply replace all previous present and future blank endorsements with special endorsements. So back then I didn't know that I was still learning. Yeah. But then as I learn more and more and more, I realize that's essentially what I have been trying to do without really knowing the wording and how it worked, right? Uh, fraud on these accounts is due to a complete lack of disclosure of the terms of the loan as well as the collateralization of the original promissory note. Yeah, because you uh, can't have an honorable contract if there isn't full disclosure of the terms of that contract. Exactly, yeah. The orders inside this parcel constitute unconditional uh, tender of payment in accordance with UCC 3-603. So UCC 3-603, subsection B, I'm not going to pull it up because I have to start speeding this up because I have to go here in about 15 minutes, uh, just states that once you once you issue a payment, if they reject the payment, it still discharges the debt anyways. Yeah. So they can reject it if they want, but it makes no difference. It still discharges the full amount of whatever that payment was. So if the payment was $600, if they refuse that payment then $600 is still erased from whatever debt that I have with them, regardless of them accepting it or not. It makes no difference. So 71 is, is referring to the fact that once they receive that payment, they can reject it if they want, but it makes no difference. The payment still applies to the account. Okay. Number 72, the term US dollars includes Federal Reserve notes. 73, due to the original promissory... Uh, Oh, I didn't say notes. That should say due to the original promissory notes having already been swapped for Federal Reserve notes after the application was endorsed to the blank instrument. The orders inside the parcel parcels were a payment for U.S. dollars. Um, the order sent by Brandon J. Williams is an unconditional order to pay on this account. Inside the power of attorney contained a special endorsement for all past, present, and future negotiable instruments of. And you'll see it's the same endorsement that we found on a lot of the mortgage documentation. Yeah. A slash S slash means a legal signature that is not done by hand with a pen. Interesting. Okay. That's good to know. All caps, Brandon Joe Williams registered trademark is now the person entitled to enforce all negotiable instruments on all the above accounts. Person entitled to enforce is a term. You can look that up. I'm not going to get into that right now. All caps, Brandon Joe Williams registered trademark is now the holder in due course regarding all negotiable instruments on all the above accounts. Holder in due course is a technical term. You can look it up. We're not going to get into that right now. Uh, parcel was sent to CEO Stephen Squarey. Um, so, so there's a lot of issues people have been having with arbitration. So arbitration is bullshit. Arbitration is you're, you're waiving your right for a jury trial and you're waiving your right to get into discovery. Lawsuits are one in discovery when you are issued a badge a gun and a shovel if you have truth on your side the opposing people that are on the opposite side of the table are in serious fucking trouble discovery is where lawsuits are won arbitration yep. does not allow you to have discovery arbitration is fucking Bullshit. 
period. You'll see people say like, oh, arbitration is honorable and litigation is dishonorable. Fucking insanity. Yeah. It's like saying, you know, the best thing to eat is 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 liquid concrete. It's like, no. The best thing to eat is is to chew on the barrel or the muzzle of a loaded rifle. No. No. The answer is no. Arbitration is often retired judges that are paid by the company to work for the company. They're going to company employees to try to get... No, it's ridiculous. Arbitration is absolutely ridiculous. So I sent a parcel to all the parties, letting them know that all previous arbitration clauses or agreements are all fraudulent and they're all canceled. And then those were signed for. You should do that before you file any litigation. You do not want to get stuck in the defense talking about arbitration and how there is an arbitration agreement that was never canceled. And then now you're trying to cancel it in the middle of a lawsuit. It's a disaster. It's going to go on forever. It's not good. You want to cancel it now. Now that's the general factual allegations. That's just the general stuff. That's just like the overarching stuff that, that like fits the into everything. Of what happened. No, no, it could be anything. It could be just general. It could also be all this previous information applies to each individual count. Hmm. So now we're going to get into individual accounts, and then we're going to be getting into specific information regarding each individual account of which all of the general factual allegations probably apply to as well. You can see a number 84 plaintiff incorporates by reference all of the above paragraphs in this yeah. complaint as they'll fully stated herein with the same force and effect as if the same were set forth at length herein. So it's like restating all of point one through 83 again just in point number 84 regarding count one which is a breach of contract right now there's some things here that apply to everything else but it doesn't matter whatever definition of payment definition of tender the above definition is in accordance with the ucc uh, 603b had someone told me about my endorsement options i would have done a special endorsement on any instruments prior to properly perform and that MX uh, ignored my orders and questions and closed the accounts, okay? Count two, breach of fiduciary duties. They're saying that lenders do not have a breach of, do not, cannot breach, for, do not have a fiduciary duty to borrowers in the lawsuit. If you open up the docket in uh, Pacer, uh, you can look at all the different filings that are in this court case for 10 cents per page. You can download all of them, all filings and all dockets for all cases. Everywhere internet uh, throughout the whole country are all publicly available to be downloaded through Pacer, and it's ten cents per page to download them. And there's a uh, uh, there's the Free Law Project, which you can download an app called Recap or something like that. And you can anytime someone does download something off of Pacer, it goes into like a different free system. So you can get that too if you don't want to pay ten cents a page. So, anyways, there's there's all these resources to look up all this information. They're saying that. Uh, lenders do not have a fiduciary responsibility to borrowers. And then my rebuttal to that was Amex is not the lender. All caps, Brandon Joe Williams registered trademark is the lender, right? There you go. That's so, so that's so the argument that we're currently getting into in the litigation, which you can look at from the docket. Okay. So, um, plaintiff, blah, 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 blah. Brandon, uh, all caps, Brandon Joe Williams registered trademark is the beneficiary of Amex. Yeah. Uh, MX is a fiduciary duty. MX is paid to ensure the law is followed. MX has an obligation and desire to ensure UCC Article 3 is properly followed. They follow the bank, the Emergency Bank Act of 1933. MX follows 12 USC 412. This is where we have American Express National Bank has had access to the Federal Reserve window services since 10 17, 1994, according to the Federal Reserve Master Account and Services Database, which we put with that earlier. Uh, MX acknowledges that it would be in their best interest of their beneficiaries to do a special endorsement on negotiable instruments. MX acknowledges that, um, you know, if people knew how to do a special endorsement, a vast majority would do it. They never told me about that. They harm me by having an imbalanced account. Like and, digging their own grave, basically, is what it is. Yeah. So if they want to deny any of these things, they can. So so 12 USC 402, this one is about the civil money penalty that's inside of the Federal Reserve uh, Act. Yep. I don't want to get into this right now. This is like uh, the US Treasury actually collects this. So whatever, it doesn't really matter. Then we have count four, 
laundering of monetary instruments. So I get into that. Plaintiff became the person to enti enti entitled to enforce the instruments once negotiation was rescinded and clarified. Plaintiff became holder in due course. Uh, illegal possession and transfer of above negotiable instruments are retained currently with the defendant Amex. Transportation of stolen securities. I'm going to start speeding through this. I got to go here soon. Securities and commodities we might have to fraud. Have you back on, Brandon, but I mean, people should go and read this because you've made it available. Peonage. Yeah. All the different points there. Enticement into slavery. All the different points there. Sale into involuntary servitude. All the points there. Forced labor. All the points there. Benefiting financially from peonage, slavery, and trafficking in persons. That's all there too. And then demands for relief. So what needs to happen now in order to correct or fix or to balance the, the weights of justice? You see justice with the two, yeah. the two weights, the two pendulums. How do we balance? How do we create equity or balance here? Okay. Full discharge of the above loans in their current state. Full refund of each individual extraneous payment made on the accounts using Federal Reserve notes. So basically, every time I ever made a payment, all of those, quote, payments are going to be returned to me. The gifts. Yeah. 250 uh, 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 million dollars in damages payable in Federal Reserve notes, or they have an optional choice, which eliminates the need for, for paragraph 155. Amex will issue all caps Brandon Joe Williams registered trademark an Amex Centurion black card that has no limit and is automatically set off each month. This would require a limited power of attorney where Brandon Joe Williams would allow Amex to do special endorsements on the behalf of Brandon Joe Williams and all caps Brandon Joe Williams registered trademark. This would include Amex being uh, allowed to keep any interest generated on any promissory note or bill of exchange. This would also include the possibility of allowing these securities to mature in an effort to bring larger interest gains to Amex. Brandon Joe Williams wants to ensure that Amex is being paid well for the work in order to establish equal consideration. There has to be adequate or equal consideration in order for there to be a contract. Sure. If there's not adequate consideration, there is no contract, period. Um, you could even go that direction with these lawsuits and you can win very easily. Um, but that's not what I'm trying to do. Uh, and then the last line here, this optional choice would eliminate the need, the needed relief of paragraph number 155. Yeah, it's like pay me 250, send me 250 million in re federal reserve notes, or all you have to do is just open a, a credit card account in my name with no limit. So and you can start like making money on that account right away. That's brilliant. So do you get paid or do you want to pay out $250 million? It's a pretty easy choice. Now, just out of curiosity, um, how did you come up with 250 million? Just every single transaction on the account is a, is a separate felony. Mm. So it's like hundreds and 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 hundreds of felonies. But did you measure it precisely or you just come up with a number? No, no, I just came up with it. It just okay. it just seemed like a, a good relief number that made me feel comfortable. Because I, I'm guessing part of the rules in in the federal claim is that there's there's no upper limit. I mean, you could basically uh, set. No, set if you go to if it goes all the way to trial, then then you know it's possible that the the jury won't award you two hundred fifty million dollars. Sure. Maybe they only award me a hundred million. Right, but there's nothing in the in the rules and procedure that says you can't claim like whatever number you feel is just. No, because basically what you're doing the whole time in, in litigation is you're arguing your side and they are they are opposing from that side and you are bashing into each other and bashing into each other. And then there's information being collected in discovery and then there can be additional parties added into the case. And it's just this it's this ongoing it's it's literally like a, like Dungeons and Dragons. It's like this whole board and there's like pieces being introduced and there's pieces being removed and there's all these things happening and there's positioning that's occurring. It's a whole, yeah. it's a whole thing that you're doing. This is so powerful. I mean, I remember when you released, when you first filed this and you mentioned on your website that you had posted it, I almost immediately went and read through the whole thing. And I was just, I mean, honestly, I took, I, I took it. I didn't copy things verbatim, but I took ideas when I started writing some of my conditional acceptance letters, and I know you got to leave in a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah. and we really do appreciate all the time that you've spent, Brandon. We probably should have you back a third time. We'll see how people, we'll see, you know, how people respond to this podcast and what kind of questions come up. And obviously, 
if you guys like this one and you want to move forward, uh, the next one will be brand new. We can do something here pretty soon, actually. It would be a brand new subject, which we would start to actually go through Pacer. Yeah. We would actually pull up the docket and we would actually start going through the timeline of all the filings that are going into the case. Yeah, that'll probably take three hours. In, in, yeah. Right. So, great. So, if you guys want to go in that direction, let me know. I'll be more than happy to do that with you. And that would be kind of a, exclusive because i haven't done that on any show yet uh um, yeah, my goal here is just to give people who are watching this who are obviously some of whom are probably going to embrace this process the opportunity to learn as much as they can because i know you're going to be creating a course around this at some point as you get more success but it's going to be a while um because i want to make sure it's like all solid and i know the whole thing a to z um and i win something and we really get some killer uh knock some things out of the park um so, you know, we might lose something, we might go to appeals, we might, you know, it might be a, we might go criminal with some things, we might go a different direction with civil, we might go, you know, there's a lot of different, we have a lot of backup plans and there's a lot of things in the works um, just to make, because we, we don't want to fall on our face and not have a backup plan. So we've already got a lot of contingencies and all sorts of good things in place, um, ready to go as needed. But um, yeah, and then uh, are you going to be sending me a copy of this to put on my channel as well? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to edit Perfect. it just like last time. Not not too yeah. much, but I'm just going to give it a little nice touch and then I'll send you over the file. In that case, let's let's set up something here pretty soon and I'll come back and then because um, I've been wanting to do a video for my people, too, on the whole pacer thing. So let's um let's talk about booking something out maybe in a couple of weeks and we'll we'll go through a little journey through pacer with you guys. I think it'll be fun. Let's do it. OK, my friend. Amazing. Thanks so much, Brandon, Joe Williams, folks. Uh, like I said, watch this video as many times as you need to, to gain that. Cause sometimes you have to, you know, it has to inculcate, it has to like bake in your mind. So yeah, Brandon, I really appreciate the time you spend with us. Super powerful stuff. And I'm looking forward to the next conversation as well. Thank you, my friend. Okay. Take care. You too. Bye -bye. Be well.